Hello. Good beginning of the afternoon to everybody. Thanks for being here. This is the outset then of our 14th Annual Central and Southwest Asian Studies International Conference here at UM. And um, you could ask yourselves, well, uh, what then? I mean, we have keynote presentation on, um, on France at the outset of the Central Asian Conference. But actually, our globalized uh, world in which the recent bloody events in France and Belgium are taking place provides a perfect and unavoidable context for the speech. Our uh, guest, uh, we are honored to have him here on campus, is Dominique Thomas. Uh, who is Madeleine Alitassia Professor and Chair of the Department of French and Francophone Studies at UCLA. Uh, he is Professor of African, European and Global Studies. He directs the Center for the Study of Global France and the Global Studies Paris program as well. He is the author, co-author, editor or co-editor of uh, some 30 scholarly volumes and I will give you just a few uh, of them for the record. Uh, there is, for example, Black France, Colonialism, Immigration, and Transnationalism, Africa and France, Postcolonial Cultures, Migration and Racism, Museums in Postcolonial Europe, A Companion to Complete, La France Noire, Colonial Culture in France since the Revolution, Francophone um, Afropean Literature, Noir Don, The Emission of Race, and then, recently, uh, the Charlie Hebdo events and their aftermath, racial advocacy in France. And now, actually, he, is, uh, he just completed his work uh, on forthcoming the Vers la Guerre des Identités in French and published in France, and the colonial legacy in France. So the list is impressive and it's not complete. He is, uh, as well, a regular media commentator on contemporary French politics and culture and African affairs. He also edits the Global African Voices series at Indiana University Press that focuses on translation of African literature into English and he is himself a translator. He has held fellowships, residencies and visiting professorships in numerous countries among which Australia, the Congo, France, Germany, Mali, South Korea, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And recently, in 2015, he, has, uh, he was elected to the Academy of Europe. Uh, and uh, as you uh, have probably uh, seen, uh, his presentation today is titled France, Territorial, Social, and Ethnic Apartheid. Please do warmly welcome Professor Dominique Tom. Thank you to you for being here and uh, for your uh, generous invitation to come uh, to your uh, university and to this state and to this city um, at a moment in, uh, in the history, uh, as uh, yesterday uh, reminded us, where all of these questions are incredibly uh, relevant uh, and uh, important. Uh, and so thank you also to, uh, uh, to all the organizers. And I'm so happy to be here, too, with uh, Fatima uh, Siddiqui, whose work I've uh, admired for years and who's speaking uh, later today. So it's a, it's a great honor, and thank you uh, for being here. As you know, um, Paris, November 13, 2015, Brussels, March 22nd. Uh, 31 dead, 300 injured. These are the sorts of things we're hearing about uh, more and more. Uh, it's a global question. Uh, it impacts Tunisia, Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, Thailand, Pakistan, Baghdad, Turkey, 
uh, and so on. And it's important in these conversations to remember the non-European sites and places in which these kinds of questions, attacks, and so on uh, are the uh, subject uh, of the day. But earlier, in January 2015, French Prime Minister Manuel Valls had used the word war, a word he has since repeated on multiple occasions, and as recently as today, Ted Cruz, Donald Trump, and many others have used this kind of language to describe the November attacks in France. What Manuel Valls said was, what I want to say to the French people is that France is at war. What happened was a systematically organized act of war. A few days later, on November 16, speaking in Versailles before a joint session of parliament, President Francois Hollande declared this was an act of war. And then on November 27, at a national ceremony held at the Invalides to honor the civilian victims of the attacks, the president paid homage stating that, we will fight to the end and we will win and France will do everything possible to destroy this army of fanatics who committed these crimes. According to the historian Patrick Garcia, the Invalides is, are especially symbolic because they correspond to a national monument for those who lost their lives for the nation for military casualties. The November 13 victims have therefore been elevated to a rank traditionally reserved for military heroes. This does not mean that they are combatants as such, but there is something of that nature implied. The attacks were an act of war, we are at war, and these victims are therefore war victims. But what I will ask today, what kind of war is it exactly? At first appearance, we seem to be talking about a very classic kind of war, yet one in which all victims are honored as soldiers, in which an entire nation is composed of combatants, a war between two states, at least, the French state and the Islamic state, two armies with a clear enemy, military objectives, and finally one in which an effective strategy will promise to deliver a victory. De facto, one finds oneself a combatant in this war. In the end, whether or not the war is itself classic or not is secondary, since there can be no doubt that we are at war both here and over there. A war that is somewhere between a cold war and a clash of civilization, a war in which each individual must now choose her or his side, a conflict one should not forget that is also simultaneously a political civil war. The word has seeped into the collective consciousness. We are at war. Take note. And this war jeopardizes, first and foremost, our identities. An identity that we would like to safeguard, protect, defend. An identity our enemies are also seeking to impose on us in our banlieue housing projects or in the form of terrorist attacks the very kind driving ISIS, Daesh, and so on. A few months prior, in January 2015, in the aftermath of the attacks against the Charlie Hebdo weekly newspaper, the Prime Minister had evoked the existence in France of a territorial, social, and ethnic apartheid, war and apartheid, two terms that point to a post-colonial crisis that can partially be explained by the profound economic political and social asymmetries associated with the so-called global south. How can we improve then our understanding of how we arrived at this point? How can one explain rising extremism and populism, the recrudescence of hatred towards Jews and Muslims, establish connections between those who see evidence of a decline and a clash of values? How do we address the malaise in the underprivileged housing projects of Europe gauge the effects of nostalgia and the impact of memory, or understand, for that matter, the role that colonial culture continues to play over a much longer history, and analyze the kind of institutional forgetting that has come to characterize the art of governance in France and elsewhere. Understanding should not be confused with excusing, as Manuel Valls has made emphatically clear in November 2015 at the Senate, when he said, echoing the sentiments of many people, I've just about had it with those who keep coming up with cultural and social explanations for what happened, end quote. The past, social injustice, 
discrimination, religious adherence, or memory wars may not be able to explain everything, but they most certainly cannot be dismissed entirely. Refusing to understand is tantamount to believing only in what one sees, refusing to go beyond appearances, and to blindly enter into war. Only a few steps separate the refusal to understand from obscurant obscurantism. Understanding the origins of contemporary events is the best way of making sure that they don't happen again, or for that matter, spread exponentially, but it is also a way of resolving conflict. The persistence of this denial in France is not without consequences, as Pascal Blanchard, Nicolas Bancel, and Sandrine Le Maire have argued, since it introduces and stirs up conflict over memory, while also bolstering the sentiment among central, certain members of the population, in particular those French people that are descendants of post-colonial immigrants, that their history is being ignored. It also encourages people to turn a blind eye when it comes to neo-colonial policies in Africa. As we may remember, the riots and uprisings of 2005 revealed the degree to which the specter of the imperial past continues to haunt France, faced with the concerted efforts of neo-reactionary and nostalgic discourse and the deafening silence of the state on these and related issues. At the same time, though, the migration question has become, yet again, a problem in a context in which the word immigration in French simultaneously designates migratory flows and policies, but also race relations or policies pertaining to ethnic minorities. But this historical period also happens to coincide with the birth of at least a third generation of jihadists, one that found in the urban riots and uprisings of 2005 a form of inspiration that would lead to a quite different way of conceiving of revolt in the West. After the failure of bin Laden's world revolution, theorized by his former disciple Abu Musa al suri in his 2004 book, The Global Islamic Resistance Call, a new global terrorism now targets Africa, the Middle East, the United States, Europe, and elsewhere by enlisting support from marginalized youth. But things really started to speed up in 2010 with a degree prohibiting the concealment of the face in public spaces in France, which President, and President Sarkozy's nationalist, national security speech in Grenoble in the same year, and the rise of populist parties throughout Europe. At the same time, the so-called Arab Spring was well underway in the Middle East and North Africa. As Gilles Kepel has shown, we are witnessing a kind of hystericization of the debate on Islam, in which the political elite is particularly to be held responsible given their incapacity to measure the dramatic geopolitical realignments that have resulted from the Arab Spring, as well as the growth of Islam in French banlieue housing project neighborhoods. This is the result of a kind of return of colonial repression, coupled with the ethno-racial exclusion factory that the housing projects have become. Ahmed Damani, for example, a fitness instructor who was close to an accomplice of one of the Bataclan attackers um, in November in Paris, had the following to say, and I quote, I'm not convinced that the authorities really have any idea as to what is going on in these neighborhoods in which community harmony or peaceful coexistence does not exist. Young people around here are searching for an identity and values at an age when they are especially vulnerable, but they get no help. I'm quite surprised with this display of force from the authorities with no regard for the origins or root of the problem. Immigration, urban violence, the emergence of a small radicalized faction in the projects as confirmed by the background of recent jihadists, colonial memory, a chaotic political situation in parts of the Maghreb and Middle East, the mobilization of international terrorist networks and mixed Western response and international interventions, in other words, a multi-dimensional set of fragments that can be seen to coalesce. Understanding the root of this configuration is therefore key. Understanding that the war is henceforth here, that it is built on the failures and shortcomings of a social system, that it attracts and mobilizes a fraction of one generation, and that at the opposite end of the spectrum, a portion of public opinion no less than seven million voters during the second round of the 2015 legislative elections now believe that a portion of the national body has no or no longer has a legitimate claim to the French national territory. A post-colonial divide has therefore emerged between the them 
and the us. After all, on est chez nous, we're in our house, has now become the slogan of the French National Front, and once again, a conceivable norm delinking the illegitimate children of post-colonial immigration from the native population considered to be of pure French stock. The context of recurring crises have contributed to the emergence of the identity component of this war, evenly spread between the prototype of the patriot and that of the enemy, of the national community and the foreigner, who are by very definition hostile. However, this foreigner can also today be French or binational, which is of course all the more frightening or distressing. The option of stripping foreign-born binationals of their French nationality has received broad partisan support. In fact, what we have observed is a dramatic rise in suspicion towards certain segments of the French population whose genealogy is not, strictly speaking, French, as is the case already for the descendants of post-colonial immigrants from the Maghreb, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, and so on. The fact is that one of the logical outcomes of decolonization has been the dual-based memory that defines post-colonial immigrants. They are the fruit of a history in which they are the descendants of migrants, but also former native subjects of the French Empire. At the same time, they are inserted into a French society that neither recognizes this dual affiliation, nor for that matter colonial or post-colonial history, the latter also serving to explain the physical presence of these populations and the debasing representations that continue to cling to them. This complex relationship to history and memory, in addition to banishment in disadvantaged neighborhoods and ethno-racial based discrimination, contributes to feelings of marginalization that are then also compounded by religious stigmatization, a factor superimposed on these historical markers. In order to destabilize Western societies, Daesh's strategy has been to nurture and emphasize precisely these kinds of polarizations by drawing attention to forms of historical humiliation during colonialism or in the guise of contemporary Western imperialism as a way of mobilizing Muslims or future converts in order to provoke civil wars in Europe and bolstered by the identity crisis that Europe itself is experiencing. Likewise, anti-Semitism also serves as a device for mobilizing support from excluded populations in disadvantaged neighborhoods by instrumentalizing the Palestinian question. From this perspective, France therefore finds itself on the front line because of its colonial past with the French mandate of Syria and Lebanon in the 1920s and 1940s, colonies in sub-Saharan Africa and colonies and protectorates in the Maghreb. The weight of post-colonial migratory presence in mainland France, the social crisis in the housing projects, as well as forces of inertia to be found in colonial nostalgia and that appeared in any attempt to achieve any kind of collective or shared narrative when it comes to writing French history. Today then, we are caught in an identity milestone that has been handed down from imperial history, infused with cultural and economic globalization, multi-directional migratory flows, all of which were brought into light, into the light of day during the November 2015 attacks. In a book published in France in 2015, Le Grand Repli, that explored the concept of defensive identity, authors Nicolas Bancel, Pascal Blanchard, and Ahmed Boubeker argued that France is a plural society that has never thought of itself as multicultural. And I'll get back to this in a moment. How then, can one recapture that feeling of peaceful coexistence that illuminated France on that fateful day of January 11, 2015, when millions of people took to the streets in unity marches? Coherent answers to these and other questions can only take place in a constructive and productive manner by inscribing the situation in a much longer history, one that attempts to take into consideration the interwoven nature of several rich traditions and memories, as well as the religious fact and its political dimension. The existentialist crisis, or the existential crisis France is undergoing, is anchored in General de Gaulle's conviction that France cannot be France without grandeur, and in Charles Moraz's vision of a nation that is in slow decline. The findings of a study conducted in 2015 by Ipsos are extremely revealing. 
26% of respondents stated that France is in decline and that the situation is irreversible. 70% agreed with the following statements. Firstly, in my daily life, I seek inspiration from the past or things used to be better in France and we no longer feel at home in France. A category, of course, in which respondents who also stated they were national front supporters agreed at a level of 95%. Additional questions revealed that two-thirds of all respondents felt that there were, quote, too many immigrants in France. How then do we convert this feeling, this sentiment, there are too many, into reality in a country in which demographic research reveals that one-third of people living in France today have foreign roots? What we have, effectively, is a meeting between two ideologies, that of the enemy within, facing off against the anxiety of decline, almost as if France now needed a designated enemy in order to define itself in the 21st century. These indicators are striking, and as we've already mentioned, can be corroborated by both the quantity and the popularity of books that have been devoted to this malaise, in which the question of de-civilization, for example, has been railed, that is, a process by which the white population is being supplanted or substituted by Afro-Maghrebi racial mixing and Muslim immigrants so that the time will eventually come when native-born French people will be outnumbered. So these are the sort of the discourses of the, the far right. Decline, immigration, identity, conflict, terrorism, an inventory of terms that have become inseparable. In fact, a worldview that has shaped the work of the philosopher Alain Finkelkraut for the past 25 years. For according to him, France is disintegrating. Not that long ago, we were the envy of the world. But today, people feel pity for us. Once an example to emulate, people are today repelled by us. The stubborn refusal we are witnessing in Eastern European countries when it comes to accepting permanent quotas of asylum seekers on their soil is because they don't want to end up like us, end quote. These kinds of statements have become all too common mainstreamed, in fact, by both sides of the political spectrum, contaminating the field of politics in what has become a process of constant one-upmanship between Marine Le Pen's Front National, the National Front, and the former union for a popular movement that was led by Nicolas Sarkozy and that has recently been renamed the Republicans. In this dynamic, the right is fighting for ownership over traditional National Front xenophobic and identity policies in what has become a scramble for authenticity, all in the name of upholding precious Republican ideals and values and announcing what has been increasingly described in a more general faction, fashion as a kind of Le Penization, to take Marine Le Pen's name, of the public domain. Now, France is certainly not alone in the West when it comes to the issue of defensive identities. The concern with protecting national identity in a much longer history of nationalist and racist positions that were forever immortalized in the deplorable words of the conservative politician Enoch Powell, whose nationalistic, glorificatory, and patriotic tone in his Rivers of Blood speech in 1988 warned of the deadly threat immigrants posed to British life that were echoed more recently in Germany in 2010 in Tilo Saracen's controversial book, Deutschland schafft sich ab, Germany abolishes itself, in which the author established a correlation between the drop in the birth rate and the increase in Muslim immigration, bemoaning the gradual disappearance of a population of pure German stock. As evidence of the extensive appeal of such positions are to be found in recent electoral successes of far-right populist parties in the UK, Austria, Italy, Greece, Sweden, Switzerland, Netherlands, Bulgaria, Poland, and for that matter, the disquieting xenophobic, racist, sexist, and Islamophobic positions aimed at exciting hatred found in statements made by representatives of the Tea Party and Donald Trump in the process of selecting a Republican Party nominee. The situation in France is thus far from being unique. Rather, one finds global concern for analogous issues, included in countries that have never had colonies or empires and in which there has been no migratory pressure of the kind that is today reshaping the electoral map of Europe. The revolt that took place 
in the French housing projects in 2005 drew international attention to socio-ethnic and socio-racial inequalities in France, caught in the trap of a past that refuses to pass, as Benjamin Stora has proposed, the questioning of the relationship of the past seems perfectly legitimate when one considers the failure of the political establishment to evaluate the impact of imperial history on the present, a failure that extends to the domain of assimilation and integration policy, and that has yielded ethnic reservations, as they've been described in urban zones, as an outcome of urban policy over the past 50 years. Likewise, and let's be very clear, war and apartheid are not my words, but rather those of the government, indicative of the range of ills and evidence in French society today. Now, the term apartheid is, of course, especially striking. And when Prime Minister Manuel Valls used the word in 2015, he was neither referring to legal apartheid, as was the case in the policies of the National Party in South Africa in 1948 and 1949, nor to official segregation of the kind found in colonial empires in the United States, Brazil, or elsewhere, but rather to a situational apartheid that has been handed down as a heritage, albeit one that underscores an awareness that French society has become clearly ethnicized and that is the outcome of a historical amalgamation of conscious and unconscious administrative and social practices that have been at work since the process of colonial independence got underway in the 1950s and that are to be found in migration and urban policies in France since the Fifth Republic was enacted in 1958. On the French political landscape, the main themes of the right are an, obsessive, an, are an obsessive fear of immigration from the former colonies, a rejection and refusal of foreigners, focalization on Islam, apprehension and concern over the question of gender, and dread over the substitution then of the white population through racial mixing. At this pivotal moment, few political leaders have come out, for example, and overtly claimed to be, say, anti-Muslim or anti-Roma. Instead, politicians say they are defenders of the West or advocates for security, waving instead the flag as protectors of national preference. This political climate has encouraged the gradual ethnization of a range of problems, religious radicalism, problems that have been compounded by the massive discrimination of which the residents of housing projects are victims, resulting in their near total separation and exclusion from the West of society and then in withdrawal. A country associated with the invention of a diverse society long before others would embrace such a paradigm. Admittedly, of course, with all kinds of contradictions and paradoxes, but appears to be slowly metamorphosing into a segregationist society. Summoning the notion of poor whites, and I quote, is now relatively common. Another reminder of the United States and South Africa as well as a number of other cultures, such as Narendra Modi's overtly anti-Muslim new society in India, and forms of segregation that were found in early 20th century Brazilian society. The consequences of this political polarization has been to divide French society into factions, the one in which poor whites now identify along those lines and vote accordingly, and the other that drives youth from immigrant backgrounds to unbelong, as Salman Rushdie has used the term, and reject France and fabricate alternative, and often it's, impossible, it's important to underscore, mythic categories of identification. Comparison is not always possible, but having said this, the situation today shares many points of commonality with the early 1930s in Europe, a period that saw the old national parties and leagues emerge from obscurity at the, time, at the same time as other increasingly radical political movements. In terms of the present situation, deep-seated frustrations have exacerbated tensions, and the objective is to defeat this other, fight abroad through military intervention, or deport and expel foreigners while engaging in government-sanctioned rafle, a word that means roundups, formally used in France in 1942 to evoke the rafle du Veldiv in Paris, which led to the roundup and deportation of French Jews to concentration camps. As a character in Feisagen's 2006 novel, translated into English as Dreams from the Ends States, since the decree of 2006 and its aim of expelling 25,000 people a year, it's like there's a smell of gas in the queue 
in front of the immigration office, end quote. No longer capable of being inclusive, in fear or terror of outsiders, the national community now excludes. Is color still the indicator of societal fracture, including in the realm of the anti-racist struggle? After all, as sociologist Eric Fassin suggests, and I quote, in a society in which everyone is now defined in racial terms, through no fault of their own, or, as the case may be, may well, even white people become whites. And this is the reason for concern today, since are we not at risk of a gulf opening up between a white anti-racism and a non-white anti-racism, end quote. Indeed, if one looks at the American context, we know that affirmative action was first introduced by Kennedy in 1961, and the UK, the Parliament, established the Race Relations Act in 1976, and the Commission for Racial Equality, measures whose specific objective were to target discrimination on the grounds of race. But the French Republic remains one and indivisible, as enshrined in the first constitution of 1791, a principle that underscores the commitment to protecting the rights of all citizens, regardless of ethnicity, religion, or other social associations. But behind this mirage of words and grand principles, the equality of citizens simply does not exist. As the Cameroonian political scientist Achille Mbembe has argued, the perverse effect of this indifference to difference is thus a relative indifference to discrimination, end quote. The truth is that ethnic discrimination has never been taken into consideration, or for that matter, seriously combated in France. The wake-up call has thus been all the more brutal, and the fact remains that the vast majority of French intellectuals and scholars have refused to confront this reality without even mentioning the political elite that has basically turned their attention away from this fracture and has, as a consequence, only grown deeper. These are the circumstances in which neoconservative voices have gained prominence, a conjunction with an upsurge in support and electoral advances made by the National Front, developments fueled by a desire to turn back time in the face of societal transformations that appear out of control, and in their thinking, migration and racial mixing, along with a rushed and ill-thought-out opening up to globalization, have together contributed to a dramatic weakening of the middle classes and to precipitating the working classes into a downward spiral toward economic destruction. Raphael Lioget, in a recent book, has shown that Europe is the area of the planet in which globalization is most heavily criticized. According to the Eurobarometer that tracks these things, 62% of EU residents believe that globalization has not been of benefit to its citizens. Now, these transformations have thus taken on a revolutionary scale. The resulting precariousness, apprehension, and anxiety have spawned a demand for reassurance, for protection and security as the logical outcome of the unremitting call for a return to the past. There is no doubt that France is undergoing rapid cultural and social transformation. And in the face of these changes, fear is not itself an unexpected response. But the refusal to take the measure of this newfound reality is short-sighted, willful blindness even. Hamstrung by alarming expressions of religious affiliation by extremists and radicals on all sides and pervasive contempt and hatred for the West, we find ourselves traversing a minefield of identity politics. A number of interpretations have been put forward, and among these, the culturalist argument is the most common. It goes something like this. Post-colonial immigrants may very well have been faced with obstacles and a difficult path to integration, but in the end, the main issue is to be found in their incompatibility with French or European societal models, born as they are, or at the very least influenced by, cultures that don't share the same commitment to liberty." End quote. A distance, therefore, emerges between them and us that can only result in a politics of difference. For if the colonial past is foreclosed, the place of the global South in the geographic sense of the term remains crucial in the political and social imaginary, especially when it comes to the manner in which constructs and perceptions of former colonies and diasporic populations in France and in Europe continue to influence both domestic and foreign policy 
as evident as, France, as uh, Eric Fassin again has argued in the kind of political unconscious and in various forms of racism and state xenophobia that is the result rather than the cause of immigration policy. During the 2012 presidential elections, Claude Guéant, then Sarkozy's Minister of the Interior, claimed, in two, claimed on the campaign trail that, in our view, Republican principles, and in, in the view, sorry, of our Republican principles, not all civilizations, practices, or cultures are equal, end quote. Now, these statements are all connected to similar representational modes and colonial mentalities that find themselves constantly updated and adapted to new circumstances in these instances related to ethnic, race relations, immigration, and underscoring a supposed clash of civilizations that results from migration that have, been, that have neither offered the predicted outcomes or that which has been wished for. However, this supposed clash of civilizations is, in fact, totally far-fetched, far -fetched, as Rafael Liogier has convincingly demonstrated, because when one looks at current conflicts, these have nothing to do with clashes between civilizations. Instead, what we have are a combination of conflicts between states, terrorist organizations, organized crime units, economic networks, and various globalized positions on identity. The idea, then, of a civilization under siege is more typical of the kind of stance found today in Europe that has itself become fundamentalist, in other words, retracing its forlorn origins and hegemony that bring one million marches to the streets one day in favor of gay marriage and one million the, foreign, the following day in defense of the supposedly unbroken tradition of a Catholic heritage in France. The devastating impact of these repeated assaults on minorities throughout the early years of the 21st century have yet to be fully assessed, and there is no doubt that they add a symbolic exclusion to existing forms of, dis of discrimination and disaffection while also accentuating identity-related tensions. Now, in contrast, Paul Gilroy drew attention to comparable issues in Great Britain during the 1980s in his influential book, There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, right? And when we know there ain't no black in the Bleu Blanc Rouge. But these findings, are, of course, transposable to the French context in which the collective memory of those people for whom France represents home must now be combined simultaneously with individuals and groups whose memory is also elsewhere. So the aim is not to incriminate or to make the French nation feel guilty, but rather to take into consideration this longer history as a way of shedding light on a number of societal practices that are still very much indebted to post-colonial attitudes. Such binary constructs are to be recorded in the glaring differences between those who believed in the right of the superior races over the inferior races and those who did not share this belief between those who dove headstrong into colonial wars and those who considered other avenues. French society needs to find ways to restore the imbalance, to improve its relationship to memory, to help young people rediscover their place in the national community, to overcome fear so that immigration is no longer, will no longer be relegated to the margins of citizenship. A cursory glance around the world provides multiple examples of other countries who've already began this process. South Africa, ending apartheid and embracing a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Italy, recognizing colonial crimes in Libya. Germany, acknowledging its responsibility in the massacre of the Herero people in Namibia. The British, admitting to their role in repression in Kenya, even going so far as to initiate compensation measures. And the Dutch have formally apologized for their colonial misdeeds, and the Japanese to the Korean people for their use of military comfort women. But for the new generation of migrants, the passage to what is now increasingly being described as fortress Europe is complex and supplemented by a new vocabulary structured around such terms as detention center, refugee status, camps, quotas, the clandestine. Ethnic minorities experience this gaze on a daily basis and are permanently reminded that whether they are French of foreign origin, foreigners, undocumented, refugees, exiles, and so on, that they will never be part of society. In other words, that they will never be like us while at work in their neighborhoods or in the schools of this pristine white France to which they are relegated 
and to which people of pure French stock do all they can to avoid sending their children. This fracture therefore touches upon every aspect of society, conditioning as a result a broad range of daily practices. In 2013, then Minister of Justice Christiane Taubira, a black woman from the French Overseas Department of Guyana, was described as an ape by Anne-Sophie Leclerc, a former National Front candidate, when she juxtaposed the image of a baby ape with the Minister of the Justice under the heading, Then and Now. Now, one may very well dismiss this egregious instance of racism by saying that they in no way represent mainstream French society. But the very fact that this racist unconscious can now be freely expressed or formulated in writing is, of course, cause for grave concern. These realities offer fertile ground upon which radical jihadists can launch their fight against whites, denounce the republic, and accuse the West. Equality is the bedrock upon which societies that wish to have a common future are built. And this is quite different from the objectives of defensive identities that reduce everything to religion or remain attached to the past. If one looks closely at the situation, a number of problems can be identified, problems that together have worked toward undermining the inclusion of ethnic minorities. In the first instance, France has clearly failed to foster a genuinely diverse society preferring up instead to uphold a model of coexistence based on moral values, but without taking into consideration the complex nature of the inter-community dynamics. Secondly, France has been incapable of explaining to native-born French people that the integration of the other is a lengthy, ambivalent, and potentially destabilizing process. And this short-sightedness has therefore also entailed a failure to appreciate the extent to which the fear generated by these transformations has, in the face of a wider social and economic crisis, left mostly economically disadvantaged or vulnerable populations feeling as if they are being racially displaced or superseded. This is the fracture upon which the National Front and other populist organizations have acted and that has permitted them to thrive, expanding their support toward increasingly vast horizons. For the past three decades, at least, the political establishment has barely touched upon the question of discrimination, such that it is, it is those very people who are discriminated against that find themselves held accountable for their circumstances and responsible for their failure to integrate. This kind of representational logic is evident today in discussions pertaining to Muslims. For if a Muslim is defined according to purely visible criteria, such as headscarves, veils, and burqas, this would completely ignore the fact that the adherence of this faith, above and beyond the multiplicity of practices and variations of Islam, cannot be reduced to vestimentary codes or ethnic categories. For to limit our observations only to the French context, a Muslim could just as well be white or black, sub-Saharan, Maghrebi, or of European origin. The process of prescribing religious identity labels is thus a conglomeration of cultural, political, and social protections, and the demonization and apportionment of blame to Islam also relies on phantasmatic constructs. Islam is omnipresent today in debates surrounding the migration crisis to Europe in the attacks that took place in Paris, Lebanon, Burkina Faso, Brussels, and so on. And Muslims have become a new global race. Presidential hopeful Donald Trump called, for example, for an end to all Muslim immigration in a context in which Islam has become inseparable from jihadism, thereby further accentuating the stigmatization of the Muslim community. It has become almost impossible to be a Muslim without being simultaneously the object of suspicion. As already mentioned, even nationals have become suspect, especially if they are binationals. Selecting one's enemy in this manner as a way to define and fortify oneself, an enemy who also appears perfectly legitimate in light of recent events and the international dimension of the problem, has proven a highly convincing as a device for enlisting support well beyond traditional far right, left constituencies, and so on. Needless to say, the terrible events that France and Belgium recently uh, experienced have brought these matters to the fore and further aggravated the state of affairs. The choice of young jihadists to go down this path of no return is then, of course, partially the result of bitterness 
of resentment and of a will to seek revenge for a rejected and stigmatized youth who, though born in France, does not feel French. But these identity fault lines do not only apply to the children of migrants or of Muslim families. More than one third of all radicals who have set off for the Middle East were converts who have shouldered and integrated the marginality and feelings of revolt of the descendants of post-colonial immigrants. Of course, ISIS and other such organizations have played a role in guiding them, in training them, and in coordinating the attacks. But above all, they have inspired them, promising a complete overhaul of society and of its values, a vengeance of sorts for those who feel, rightly or wrongly, that they are the humiliated in this long history, or at the very least, the heirs of this humiliation, finding motivation and making the decision to actually join up in France and in the West and not exclusively in the Middle East or elsewhere. This is precisely why the solutions to the situation cannot be limited to technical responses, to merely addressing and treating the problems associated with urban spaces or by renovating housing projects. These, quote, ghettos are the product of racial and social fractures, but also of mental ones that have roots in colonial practices and in forms of humiliation dating back at least to the 19th century when it comes to the racial question or the, to the 20th century in terms of imperial and colonial history. These contribute to the building of a society in which one learns very early on to which, one, to which racial category one belongs. This is how one can be born French and yet remain because the color of one's skin in the name of religion or because of some other marker, a foreigner, an other in one's own country. What is more, things are not improving for the children of immigrants. On the contrary, in fact, and the chronological third generation is facing a major crisis. At the same time, institutional racism has failed on these issues, and the banner of secularism, French laïcité, one of the founding pillars for coexistence in French society, is today being manipulated in order to exclude those who don't look like us. Political rhetoric is dominated by terms that serve to reinforce this bipolarity, terms whose prevalence have been illustrated by Cécile Alduy and Stéphane Valnitsch in the form of word clouds, and that include terms like radical, terrorist, fundamentalist, jihadist, the republic, national values, and so on, delineating and defining in the process those terms that contribute to building the figure of the enemy within. These second or third generation bearers of mixed or hybrid identities are all the more threatening precisely because of their insider status, but also because of their ubiquitous nature, linked as it is to globalization, as corroborated by the circulation of terrorists between the Middle East and Europe, among other areas. This mobility now means that all immigration is deemed suspect, and the determination to infiltrate successfully, according to some reports, terrorists and foreign fighters from Iraq and Syria has, of course, done little to improve matters. There is thus a coalescence at work between exclusion and stigmatization that has introduced a translocal phenomenon, quoting here, by which individuals raised in a local context, say a working class neighborhood in the suburbs of Paris or London, are pushed into adopting a transnational identity and association that is in fact not truly their own. This war against a part of Islam along with various attempts at rendering the religion invisible in the public space, the banning of headscarves, of full-face veil, the burqa, minarets on mosques in France, Belgium, Switzerland, Spain, Austria, and so on, have only fueled the perception of constant persecution among Muslim populations. Living together in harmony is not always something that comes naturally, no matter what illustrious minds may have to say on the subject. An effort has to be made. Mechanisms put in place that nurture dialogue, cultivate relations, provide safeguards, while also promoting an environment conducive to a more permanent social equilibrium. Likewise, foreign policy and interventions against Islamists or terrorists in France's précaré, literally its neo-colonial backyard in the Central African Republic, the Ivory Coast and Mali, 
or the destabilization in Afghanistan and Iraq, along with allied strikes against ISIS since 2014, have also sustained the idea and perception of a relentless assault on Islam, on Muslims or on Islamic countries and communities, a religion that has been targeted and the victim of aggression over a much longer history from the great Syrian revolt and anti-colonial insurgency of 1925, the Rif War in Morocco from 1921 to 27, the Tiaroua massacres in Senegal in 1944, the Sétif, Gelma, and Karata massacres in Algeria in 1945, the Malagasy uprisings of 47, the massacre of Algerians in Paris on October 17, 1961, or for that matter, the war in Cameroon, all important reference points for another collective memory that cannot be obliterated or swept under the rug. Our backs are up against the wall, and it is no longer enough to invoke the great values of secularism. Concrete efforts must be made to fight against the segregation of territories and entire segments of the French population, while at the same time standing firm in opposition to all forms of radicalism. We must endeavor to arrive at a national narrative that relinquishes the claim to the univocal, that does not adopt a warlike posture, and that seeks to better understand the situation. Only then will we be able to follow the natural course of history, a common and shared history. Many thought colonial history would just go away if it was left alone, rendered invisible, and if claims for equality were ignored. But that did not happen. The war of identities was born of this silence, of this obstinate blindness, of this democratic deficit. There are two visions, at least then, at work in France and Europe today as to how society should look, visions that can no longer be divided along simple party lines. They pit a closed, partitioned, and claustrophobic Europe, moving headstrong toward a war of identities while refusing to think about recent transformations and hiding behind the idea of a society in decline while embracing an increasingly reactionary interpretation of history against those who believe in an open, diverse society that has renounced a monolithic view of history in order to stress points of commonality and a mutually constitutive model for citizenry. Cultural insecurity has become a fashionable concept in political circles, and reactionary thinkers have managed to convince large segments of society that immigration is responsible for their deteriorating economic circumstances. The enemy within has been identified, named, and rendered visible. People are petrified of Islam, and 2015 was, because of these new attacks, a landmark year in terms of the contribution it made toward channeling this fear and turning it into the most widely shared sentiment in the nation today. The stage is therefore set for an identity conflict. There are those who dream of that blessed time when the other knew their place, their rightful place, their correct place, but it is more than time to attempt to understand the genealogy of this configuration, to relinquish collective denial and blindness in order to avoid an all-out war of identities that would be deadly for society in general. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique, for uh, this striking analysis of the situation in France and uh, in Europe, uh, more largely. Uh, we have half an hour or so. Um, it can be longer, it can be shorter. Uh, but uh, it should be uh, consecrated to discussion, questions, observations, comments. Um, and you are obviously uh, all invited to uh, participate. I would like to draw your attention to the microphone, which is just position there. So to avoid us uh, walking around with one, uh, it would be very nice of you if you would, uh, you know, kindly uh, use the one we have there. So I'm going to show the way by helping you to all follow me. Excellent. There's nothing to add, which is excellent. On target, focused, excellent, brilliant. <laughs> The only thing uh, is that 
your narrative is excellent. But in order to understand, and that's important because the solution is practically impossible. Time will tell. But there is more to it. And it's a bit uh, pessimistic what I'm going to say. There is another. It's called, let's go to, I don't want to sp spend too much time, deterritorialization. Uh, the deterritorialization is the product of globalization. So you have to bring something else than the post-colonial, you repeat post-colonial narrative and legacy, which is true, it's not enough. So you have two ways of being deterritorialized. The petit blanc, the little whites, the, the poor, the one who, who, who feel excluded in Europe, in Germany, France, uh, and the youngsters, the youth in the suburbs who live in a more or less foreclosed way. They both resort when deterioration work, it attacks identity, and the unconscious comes. And you have extreme reaction. You have the extreme reaction of the few young terrorist who, who, has a f who have a fantasmatic, fantasized conception of Islam, and you have the, 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 the whites who also resort to identity, identity crisis. They have a fantas fantasmatic, fantasized understanding of culture. Ah, Frenchness, what it used to be, you know. So you have two misrecognition, two fantasy scenario. And I don't think you can, the solution cannot be, oh, it's only a question of acknowledging the post-colonial trauma, uh, what we have done to the others. You have to go behind, beyond. And you are right, France, uh, has never chosen a multicultural solution like in England, but multiculturalism has not worked in England or Holland either. And it's beyond the post-colonial divide. Look in Sweden. Sweden had no colony. You have the same type of phenomena. So something else is at work, and I think what you have to go back to uh, gl uh, global politics. The, radicali the, the true radicality, I think, is what uh, globalization is doing to everybody across the world. It increases Popularization, poverty, because if you don't have extreme poverty, you you may have some extreme movement, but it's not it's not not, not according to that viral dimension. Something else is at work. You are right. It's a question of France acknowledging its colonial past, etc., and and trying to compensate for it. Uh, but it's not enough. And the solution, I think, I don't know. <laughs> but how do you deal with deterritorialization, globalization, which literally exacerbates uh, identity problems and uh, income inequalities, which means when identity is th threatened, people go to phantasmatic solution or fantasy scenario, misrecognition. Is that clear? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had trouble understanding your Irish accent, but, um, <laughs> but we're... Uh, I tried <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michel. Um, once again, I think you're, you know, you're, you're, you're dead on in this thing. I think that the first thing to sort of to think about is, of course, globalization. It's the, the absolute defining umbrella um, term that we um, have recourse to today to try and explain the sort of nature of the dynamics between the West and the rest or the West and the global South and with all the sort of complicated aspects that go along with that. I think that the thing I would like to say a little, uh, a little bit more about is that we have a really interesting historical moment where you have um, a fracturing uh, of, of national entities and, and a sort of re-emergence of kind of micro-national uh, affiliation. So we can talk about the collapse and dismantling of the Soviet Union, of the former Yugoslavia, of Ukraine, Crimea, you know, those sorts of things and, and elements. And at the same time, organizations, entities like the European Union, endeavoring and struggling until very recently to create, um, as you sort of talk about, sort of to move away from the notion of territory and borders and so on to, to define that sort of identity. And so there are two things to say. First of all, actually, that the European Union has done an appalling job of promoting the notion of Europeanness, right, in a positive, um, a positive sort of sense of the term, right. Um, people in, uh, you know, Great Britain still say that they go to Europe for their holidays, right, in France and Italy and so on too. Um, Italians will say they're Italians. Maybe their passport says European Union, but there's very little identification, even awareness, understanding, and even participation in the democratic mechanisms of the European Union, right. Right. And what's so interesting about that, too, is actually so many of these marginal organizations on the extreme right are not able to find electoral representation in France in terms of the biparty system, but they go to the European Union 
So Le Pen is against the EU, would like to see withdrawal, but has a, a seat in the European Parliament, right? So it's interesting how he gets used to that. But ultimately, the European Union has defined itself in terms of what it is not, rather than what it is. And it's the not that's problematic, right? So you build a wall, imaginary, phantasmatic, and say that everything that lies beyond this in the global south, essentially, you know, North Africa and beyond, it's not Europe, it's not us. But in fact, the internal logistics and, and geography of Europe itself are far, more, are far more complicated than that. So Nicolas Sarkozy can well say, uh, Turkey, that's not in Europe, you know, that's in the Near East, or it's getting close to the Middle East and so on. But just look at this question of territory. The European Union is also French Guiana, which is in Latin America. It's Martinique and Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. It's uh, Mayotte in the Indian Ocean, right? It's Ceuta and Melilla. Spanish enclaves inside Morocco, right? It's the Canary Islands in close proximity to the West African coast and so on. So that the very definition of what those kind of borders and boundaries represent is itself problematic. But this building of an identity about sort of, you know, we are Europe because we are not that is hugely problematic, right? And but we see the ways in which and this latest sort of migration question and so on has brought this to the fore because for the last 10 years or so, the European Union has been focusing on kind of lockdown mechanisms, right? Border control, surveillance, and, and so on too. And the colonial history then is incredibly important in the French context, but you're absolutely right that we've got, we're talking about 28 European Union members who all have very different histories. And I mentioned the fact that some of these issues and countries have issues that have never had colonies, right? Or that only indirectly contributed to the sort of, to the colonial era. But in the case of France, I think it's absolutely impossible to read the current context without looking at the question of, of um, uh, A, a French colonial history, and B, a French neo-colonial practices. Because even in the era of globalization, France's interest in bolstering African heads of state, of engaging through organizations like the Mediterranean Union that Sarkozy pushed so heavily for, are precisely to maintain those age-old spheres of influence, right, in the face of China, in the face of Brazil and India and other global players and partners. And if indeed globalization is working in certain areas of the world, in Europe, you can see, first of all, through the Eurobarometer, the kind of skepticism about Europe and that too is that the European Union, for the most part, is also far more invested in this kind of mythic narrative you talk about, about greatness being located in the past and has not yet found a way to define itself in the future. And we see these kinds of struggles now. It's whether it's the migration crisis, the Greek crisis, the vote in Scotland, uh, the upcoming referendum in the UK as to whether or not to leave the European Union. And we see more fracturing and breaking down and reinstitution of national borders and abolishing of discussion of the Schengen borders and open circulation and so on that are actually taking us all the way back to a kind of territorial notion of space rather than a more globalized porosity kind of model. Thanks, uh, Dominique. Uh, more questions, please. Um, yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, these ultra-nationalist right-wing parties that are coming to power in Europe, they're not only anti-immigrant, but they're also very European Union skeptical. Um, this brings to, to mind one uh, our story I read from uh, the German press of you know mass uh, rapes and sexual mm -hmm. harassments on the part of immigrants. But what's been coming out lately is, you know, not only was the story not true, but it originated in the Russian press. So I'm, I guess I'm asking, is there a greater, greater geopolitical um, aspect to this where certain international players um, would like to see the decline of the European Union? I would say, you know, and there's sort of, you know, the, the paradox really is that, I mean, in some ways you could argue that these institutions are so outdated. I mean, France alone, you could say, is perhaps irrelevant today, right? Um, I think, you know, the UK might do, uh, might do a little better, but some of these sort of old, you know, powerful, you know, colonial era empire states are certainly being, um, you know, re their role and position and strength is clearly being redefined in the new global landscape. Now, the thing that you bring up then, I, I can't let that go without talking because it's so absolutely fascinating. So what he's referring to is New Year's Eve in Cologne, one uh, German city in which there were somewhere between 800 and 1,000 reported attacks uh, against women that took place on the particular, you know, on that particular uh, evening, and there were similar kinds of things that took place elsewhere. So the first thing to talk about is 
and the very definition of this other within Europe, right? Because the media does a very bad job of distinguishing between a migrant, say, and between a refugee, right? So these kinds of issues, and then between an immigrant. So we know that a refugee is someone fleeing a, 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 an area of conflict, uh, seeking political protection, and to be able to prove and justify um, that this was a, an issue back home, and that brings in, therefore, you know, the, uh, the UN Convention, da 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 so you have to step up and do something. A migrant is someone who crosses an international border, so we're back to the question of territory, and whose status in the country in which that individual has arrived is therefore uh, illegal. They have no visas, they have no papers, and they can therefore be deported. So there's tremendous pressure internationally and within the EU to be very careful about defining people as refugees because of the responsibilities that that then introduces, right? As opposed to defining them as migrants, right? Now, interestingly enough, uh, whether it's in sort of popular Amer you know, German newspapers like Bild, the Russian press, the Daily Mail in, in Britain, and other right-wing you know, uh, newspapers, was to immediately link the attacks that took place uh, in Cologne on that evening to the migration crisis, right? When in fact, the majority of people that were responsible for whatever it was that happened that night, some were sexual aggression, some were pickpocketing, you know, some were other uh, sort of violations, were in fact immigrants people who are either born in the country and don't have access to legal papers or who have uh, uh, migrated and don't have the possibility to access integration mechanisms, language classes, employment opportunities and so on too, and who end up at the margin of society in you know, underworld crime, criminal activities and so on and so forth. We saw that also three days ago when a report published by the German Federal Police came out to show that crime uh, in um, Germany has gone up exponentially uh, with the migration crisis, right? But if you break down those statistics, I mean, of course, there's been a 440% increase um, in uh, refugees arriving in the country uh, that has translated into some uh, rise in sort of crime. But if you break down those statistics, a lot of them are uh, you know, public transport violations, petty thefts, and so on too. But the way in which this kind of discourse, statistics and so on, can be recuperated by those political parties that you mention is incredibly effective, right? And it takes a lot of work for sociologists and historians and political activists to counter the very simplistic ways in which these kinds of questions are reduced in the media or by these far-right political parties, and not just by the far-right political parties, right? Because it's not just, you know, UKIP and Le Pen and so on that are the sort of terrifying political organizations. It's the ways in which this public debate, as I repeatedly say, is being mainstreamed by political parties, often on all sides of the political spectrum. Thanks again, Dominique. Uh, more questions, please. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, just because I'm a little confused and kind of the contradictory of all these kinds of themes between it. Um, after the attacks on November 11th, France still accepted refugees right afterwards. Um, do you think this is a step forward in towards of what you're talking, f in talking about in this sort of change? Or do you think that it further um, I mean to say that is it a step forward in saying that we don't have to identify people from Syria or from the Middle East as these Islamist extremists, or do you think it's a step forward in assimilation and trying to be culturally accepted, uh, acceptable and things like that? Do you think it's a step forward, and if so, what is the next step from there? Well, it's, you know, you bring up so many, you know, interesting comments. I think if you go back even further in history, we were talking about this this morning in that talk back, um, you know, radio show that in fact the, the history of migration from these areas uh, of the world that we're, that we're talking about uh, is in fact not a history of migration or immigration, it's a history of guest workers, right? It's people being invited to come to Europe to work, um, to meet the um, sort of post Second World War, um, you know, needs of Europe. Uh, before the European Union is even uh, an entity. And it goes back way before that in the incredible contributions that were made by North Africans, by Sub-Saharan Africans to um, the fight against Nazism, uh, to work in the First World War, Second World War, um, uh, and so on. Now, France has always uh, welcomed uh, refugees. Uh, it's always welcomed um, uh, migrants. And just like Germany, and other uh, uh, EU countries, in fact, has a tremendous demographic shortfall when it comes to the need for, uh, uh, for labor, right? So they need labor, they need to, to bring it in, 
the European Union has played around with a kind of US style green card system, which is a blue card scheme, which is to try and promote uh, a legal path um, uh, to immigration. And it's the, the legality that's also a problem, right? So you can't sort of send a letter from Baghdad to Paris and say, I want to come to France and be a refugee. It doesn't work that way, right? You've actually got to leave and go there. And in the same way as you can't be an illegal immigrant um, unless you actually come to France because you can't get a visa anyway. So if you're in the global south, if you're in you know, Dakar, if you're in Bamako, you can't get a visa to go to France, right? So there's a problem there with globalization and, and circulation. You've got to actually make that precarious crossing, risk your life, um, work with you know, illegal passes, smugglers, and so on, to try and get to the place you want to get to, um, to, um, to try and make that, that particular claim. Now, what's happened, and the case of France is, is particularly problematic in this way, and we can talk perhaps about how the UK has dealt with it. Certainly Germany has, has done a far better job than France, is that the political stakes of accepting refugees or migrants in France today are so very high because of the ways in which these statistics have been targeted by the far right and by the right, that under Sarkozy's administration, when in 2007 he created this new ministry, which was um, subsequently dismantled in 2010, was the Ministry of Immigration, National Identity, Integration and Development, right? So you have all these elements that are there, right? National identity needs to be protected. This was an electoral campaign promise, right? It's linked to immigration, right? The two somehow work together, right? Integration needs to be addressed. He started off with some ideas but ended up doing nothing with it. And co-development is working with countries that have these push factors, right? High unemployment, political instability to try and stop people from coming into Europe, right? So yes, France has continued to take on um, refugees and so on because it has signed the UN Charter, because it has to, right? But it has been arguing um, vociferously um, for limitations on the numbers of people that they actually do take in, right? So you're talking about tens of thousands, not millions, right? And in fact, when you look at the overall European Union population, somewhere around 550 million, the total number of people currently in camps, in detention centers, awaiting processing for either deportation or introduction into the European Union, primarily being you know, held in Greece or in, uh, or in Turkey today, it's a very small number, right, in terms of the overall sort of population of the, um, of the European Union, right? So Germany, that's been much more proactive in this way, has actually realized that you know, many of these migrants are, in fact, highly desirable workers, right, and has engaged in a, um, a fairly um, comprehensive system uh, of trying to bring people in, especially into the industrial areas uh, of the country, uh, the automobile industry, and so on and so forth, where there's a tremendous need and demand uh, for, uh, for labor, you know? Having said that, when I was talking that sort of horrendous connection with the immigration office and the smell of gas and so on too, what Sarkozy did do is that in order to respond to what the Italian sociologist Alessandro Dallago has called this kind of tautology of fear, is that people are afraid, right? They're afraid of Islam, they're afraid of global identity. So what do they do? They turn to their elected officials and say, you need to do something. So what are elected officials do? They do. They're proactive, they create policy, and so on too. So what Sarkozy did is, knowing that a very large percentage of people in France believed there were too many immigrants, he went about targeting illegals and engaging in this process I mentioned called rounding them up. But instead of fighting against immigration and, and identifying those particular individuals, he went about a kind of process of racial profiling and set statistics ahead of the fact, right? So he didn't say, look, we're going to do this. We may have 5,000, 10,000. He said, you in the local districts need to come up with a total within six months of 25,000 people, right? So people went about. They went to schools, and outside the schools, they targeted Muslims or non-white people, in some cases, people that have lived in France for 60 years and that are French and have grandchildren and so on too. So these are the kinds of problems with policies and measures that have done nothing to help improve the sorts of you know, situations and problems to which you, uh, you know, alluded. Thanks again. I mean, more questions there are, more answers are given, and more questions arise. <laughs> Please. You made the comment about in, earlier in your uh, presentation about the marginalization of, of immigrants. Yeah. And 
and then you uh, commented on the fear of the ethnic residents of of the of the country you're you're referring to it's France and the the comment that I have and the question is uh, uh, has to do with marginalization because marginalization takes place with both both uh, aspects of the society and it, just as an example uh, I was at a, a dinner party in Southern California and at this party there were a couple of people from Britain and during the dinner party I asked them where they were from and they said they were from Manchester and I humorously asked them oh what language do they speak there and of course that was bait because uh, the, the majority of the people in Manchester speak Urdu <laughs> and they literally flew into orbit and that was the end of basically the end of the dinner party and you could see the, the fear and the, the outrage of these, these Brits, you know, from Manchester. And I, I found out eventually that they did leave, even though that was where they, their residence uh, was, had always been in Man Manchester. And so I think you're, what you're, when you're referring to marginalization, I think that it's, it's, it's happening on both sides of of uh, and and because you did actually you did uh come to the, the place where you started talking about the fear of the the pe the ethnic people of france and i was waiting for you to to address that thank Can you Can i just ask you just one very quickly uh, your the english friends at the dinner party just to get this clear you were joking with them or they said that that manchester it, the main language is urdu is that no that was i knew that that's what that's what it was, because the majority of the people in Manchester are Pakistani. Okay, well, all right. Okay, thanks. That clarifies what you were, what you yeah. were saying. Okay, so look, um, first thing to say, thank you, for your, thank you for your comment and question, and I will definitely address the second part of your question, right, which is to sort of to not be blinded by how we see the question of marginalization, right? That, in fact, that's the biggest problem of all, right, is to only identify one particular group, but to also realize that there are greater social factors going on. But the first thing I must absolutely clarify is that the main language of Manchester is not Urdu, and that the majority population of Manchester is not of Pakistani descent, right? I mean, that's absolutely unambiguously, you know, the case, and that cannot be argued, contested, and so on. I mean, we remember the, you know, the sort of horrendous comments on Fox News, you know, about how there were no-go areas of Paris, because, you know, so it's just not the case. You're absolutely right um, to point out the fact that there are areas of Britain in which there are um, uh, more important um, populations that may be of Pakistani descent than, than, let's say, that have a heritage, say, you know, in Britain. But that's also complicated by a much longer history of, uh, of immigration. So that just, you know, we need to sort of clarify that. But I think you're absolutely right, and that connects up with the question that Michel also asked too, is this sort of the ways in which, as Eric Fassin pointed out in the quote that I have, is that the whole question of, of racial identification has become so problematic because actually in this dynamic, everybody has been racialized, right? Everybody now belongs to a religious group, uh, uh, an ethnic group, uh, a class group, and so on and so forth, right? And we see the same kinds of divisions in France between the rich and the poor, the old and the young, those that live in urban areas versus provincial areas, and so on and so forth, right? And this is the case throughout the, uh, the European Union. But I think you're absolutely right to point out, too, that one must not exclusively focus on what happens in these communities of marginalization. You know, the French banlieue, uh, housing project communities um, come out of a very specific way of conceptualizing um, urban housing. In the United States and in Britain, the concept of inner city housing or mixed housing has been privileged, right? What the French did in the 1960s, essentially, is to develop urban housing at the, at the periphery of urban centers in formerly industrialized areas where there were large segments of land and where they could build large tower blocks and so on. But the people who live there don't live there because they're Muslim, because they're black, because they're Muslim. They live there because they're poor. And in those communities, you have 
poor white people, you have poor Jewish people, you have poor Muslims, you have poor people who've arrived from Asia, whether it's Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, China, and so on. They're incredibly diverse communities. And the levels of interaction, community work, intermarriage are very high. But at the discourse of the state, at the discourse of officials and so on and so forth, the representation is completely different, right? But I agree with you that, you know, at any time where we're having these sort of conversations, it's important to try and understand um, and to identify, you know, other communities and members of society um, that are also uh, marginalized and excluded along gender lines, lines of sexual orientation, race, and, uh, uh, and so on, you know? So thank you. Thanks. Murdad. Thank you very much, Dominic, first of all, for your outstanding presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, the question that sometimes is raised is why France is so resistant to trying a set of different ways of integration. Uh, the American model, the hyphenated identity, you know, African Americans. We don't have that kind of model in France. You are either French or you're not. And uh, I know it might take a semester to answer that question, and you have to go back to the culture and history of France. But even at a more, for the lack of a better word, utilitarian and pragmatic fashion, you know, uh, approach, which is the British model. Uh, we were talking about it. You enter Heathrow, and there are Sikhs who welcome you. There are veiled women who welcome you. The British love money from Middle East. And uh, the amount of investment from the Middle East, especially the Persian Gulf Arab countries in uh, UK, is enormous. And it has benefited uh, the British economy. But you do not see that kind of uh, utilitarian, pragmatic approach in the case of France. So I'm wondering, why is this such a resistance uh, to uh, uh, adopting a different formula or approach to integration, and not only of Muslim population, but all different uh, ethnic and religious groupings yeah. from other parts yeah. of the world? Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, you can answer the question actually very quickly. I think we just, I mean, no, just take the United States, take France. There are, you know, you know, constitutional aspects. There are, you know, policies and so on in the United States. Let's just take, you know, a couple, you know, um, like gun policy. Many people will argue that, you know, the sort of the days in which those sort of constitutional amendments and so on were written probably have very little correlation with 21st century globalized existence, internet purchasing, you know, and all those kinds of things. And it may be that they're out of date and we need to revise them. And you have those that will advocate for that and those who will say, no, that's the way it was, founding fathers, we stick to it, et cetera, et cetera. So the origins of the French Republican model with all its complexities and so on and so forth is essentially to say, here we are, We've got Catholics and Protestants slaughtering each other. We have regions where the people in Brittany hate the Basques and the people in this area in the East hate these people there too. Let's just, you know, we come together, we create one unity called France and Frenchness, right? It's the only category. I don't want to hear about difference and so on and so forth. And it will hopefully provide a kind of social model in which coexistence will, will occur. Now, in that process, they forgot about women and voting and those things, right? But that came later. But that's essentially the model. What I would argue, me personally, not this is other people have different views, is that that particular mechanism is no longer working, right? So it's not just that not enough money has been put into making housing projects really nice or creating pathways to work and so on and so forth. It's that there's a breakdown in that kind of functioning sort of system in the ways in which it works. Identities are different. Identities mean things to people in different ways. That the simple sort of homogenization, assimilationist model of reducing everyone to sameness is being rejected. It doesn't work. And we need to come up with new mechanisms that will provide the contours of, a, of an inclusive society in which difference can operate, right? What young people will tell you, or what people who are the subject of discrimination, the object of discrimination will say to you, and I think the 2005 riots were so interesting because these were young people asking for greater participation in French society through an age-old system of taking to the streets, right, sort of ingrained in, in French revolutionary ideals and, and, and so on and so forth, in French, speaking French, and young writers 
filmmakers, documentary filmmakers, even sports celebrities, rappers, hip hop artists from the French banlieue all talked about the same thing, that there's a glass ceiling, right? That the color of our skin, that our background, that the perpetual association with us as French born, French citizens being called second generation, third generation, fourth generation, when do we stop being immigrants? You know, when can we just belong to this particular republic, right? And so, as I mentioned, Achille Mbembe, this failure to deal with this question of differentiation, right, and to acknowledge that it's an indifference to discrimination is highly problematic, right? And it's highly problematic at the level of political representation, right? We'll just take one example. Uh, 2007 elections, the French parliament has 570 elected members of parliament from mainland France, and then representatives from, you know, Guadeloupe, Martinique, like Hawaii and the US and so on too. From mainland France, the 572 or three, whatever it was, one of those people was non-white, okay? So there's a massive problem of, 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 of representation that's there too. All the research that's been done by sociologists on sort of blind CV submissions, right? Where you conceal your ethnicity, you conceal your name, or you reveal the name and so on too, all point towards discrimination. And in those areas of the public sector where you're able to track this, it's very difficult to monitor, right? Because ethnic statistics have been fought and don't exist. But if you look at the police force, 100 recruits in 1980, of which 30% are non-white. By 1990, zero officers, right? They're still doing street beat, working in neighborhoods. And so we know that discrimination is there. What has not been put in place or carefully thought about is how to go about addressing that and to actually try and counter, which they tried to do when they established a kind of sub-ministry that was run by um, a writer of North African descent, uh, Azouz Begag, which was the Ministry for Equality, is he took the French motto, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and said we have a problem with égalité, right? and try to use that as a mechanism to try and address questions of inequality as it, as it focused on persons with disabilities, ethnic minorities, and so on too. So I think the, that wasn't a short answer in the end, I'm sorry, but essentially to say that, that it's out of date. It's not working, the evidence is there, you know, and not enough work is being done in trying to fix the problem. The work that's being done is repression, surveillance, cameras, border control, and all those kinds of things, you know. Um, so, a couple of uh, observations. Um, being an immigrant to this country, being a Muslim, uh, but having been born in Kenya, which was at that time a British colony, yeah. I can really relate to all of the topics that you addressed on colonialism, immigration, not, never have been a refugee, but you know, all of those observations that you touched on, and I can really say that your observations and research have been very, very commendable and spot on. Uh, and I would agree pretty much 100% with what you said. So the difference that I would like to point out though is immigration and assimilation in the United States has been very different from assimilation and, and integration of, of immigrants in Europe, including Britain. Britain's maybe done a little bit better job than Europe, but it's still markedly different. I mean, here when immigrants come in, within a very short or order, they are made to feel American. There is such a push, a force on them to not just segregate themselves into the little Pakistan, little India, little Iran, little Persia, you know, whatever it, it might be. There's a real push to Americanize and assimilate. So we've seen less of the racial problems I think than Europe has, uh, even after 9-11. However, lately since the ISIS crisis, I feel as if the politicians um, have really appealed to a small segment of American society to kind of radicalize and pick up on this us versus them. You know, there's only six million Muslims in this country, but yet we're being made out to be this enormous, gigantic force that's coming out to kill, murder, and rape everyone while they sleep. Um, and that's just not the case. So they pick up on San Bernardino, they pick up on the Boston bombing thing. And you know, th these are huge problems. I'm not trying to belittle them, but they're making them out, they being what I call the American Taliban, because that's essentially what they are. You know, they, 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 they're kind of creating this us versus them, you know, the white, the Christian versus the Muslim civilization, this conflict 
that really doesn't exist, as you pretty much said. There is no clash of civilizations. There's a clash of us versus terrorism. And terrorism is affecting the Muslim world much more than the Western world. Right. Something that's really not talked about in the Western media. There's thousands of people killed versus tens, twenties, thirties, you know, hundreds of the Western world. Right. But still, the thing that um, the Fox News and other folks are trying to create is, look, the, here's the dialogue. Look what Europe has done. They've allowed these immigrants to come in and now look, this is the problem that they've incurred. So let's not go there. Let's not recreate what Europe has done. Let's learn from their mistakes and let's clean up this act. Um, what would you say to that? Well, thank you for, yeah, for your, your contributions. They mean, they mean a lot to me and I, and I hear all that you say from, you know, from your own experience and, and so on too, you know. Um, what I'm just, you know, astounded is that the, um, the power that, um, the demonization uh, of a community has during an electoral process in building electoral support and constituents, right? Uh, when Sarkozy in France tried to ban the burqa, uh, which ended up being a ban of, the, of, of, of anything that covers your face, right? Because he was also trying to target youth that wear hoodies, right? And, and things like that. I mean, it's quite, you know, quite extraordinary. But at the time, there were an estimated 577 women in France um, wearing, some would say choosing, electing, you know, to, uh, to wear the burqa, but it was incredibly, you know, um, his uh, electoral support went up, you know, exponentially, you know, f through targeting a very small, you know, segment of the, um, you know, of the population. And we see this happening in, um, in elections, you know, around the world. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I can only, I mean, ultimately I can only, you know, agree with you in, in, in all that you, um, all that you say, uh, we see uh, Trump and others uh, manipulating these kinds of very populist, quick, easily digestible uh, kind of concepts. But the fact is that, you know, Trump speaks and it's denounced. It's people say, ah, it's Islamophobic. But the big question is really to ask him, say, so, so Mr. Trump, you know, what's a Muslim, right? Like, how are you going to recognize these people? Um, do you want people to come through immigration control, say they're not bringing in, you know, bananas and apples and meats? Then the next box is, you know, declare your religious, you know, affiliation and uh, and so on. To the fact is that immigration in the United States, interestingly enough, um, has for the most part um, historically had very positive um, associations, right? So I think that's the greatest distinguishing aspect. Is that yes, of course, it's terrible history with Japanese internment camps. Um, we've certainly seen the, you know, the the sort of focus on. Um, you know, the southern border with Central America and so on, you know, bring out all kinds of horrendous sort of comments and statements. But essentially, you know, to be an American or as the museum in San Diego, it's not a museum of immigration, it's the museum to new Americans, right? Uh, it's a positive thing. People have wonderful stories about backgrounds in, whether it's in Africa, well, not Africa might be different, but, you know, in, in Ireland, in Germany, in, in whatever it happens to be, you know? But in recent years, it has taken on the kind of negativity and negative uh, tangential associations that we find in the European Union. It's a bad influence. It doesn't help America. It's a danger and a threat, as opposed to it having been the backbone of contemporary American society, you know? And so those kinds of shifts are, you know, are, are very much in evidence today. And there's probably not enough, you know, sufficiently sort of said about that, you know? And also about America's you know, pathway to Americanness, to integration, to green cards, to citizenship, and so on, which are very much ahead, far ahead of the ways in which citizenship is given out in uh, in Europe. You know, and that remains in most countries, you know, inaccessible to to outsiders. You know, uh, we have to um, end uh, this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, thanks, you, uh, Dominique, uh, for this. Um, uh, excellent uh, uh, analysis. Thank you for your engagement, uh, for your heartfelt.